theyeshiva.net. Rabbi Isaac told me yesterday that um, after the Shia yesterday, when he put on tefillin, so he never put on tefillin the same way his whole life. Hmm. And he said that uh, in some circles, um, in some situations he saw, people were told that uh, if you're this type of person or this type of person, or you have these characteristics or these characteristics, thy tefillin is garnished. Your tefillin is nothing. It's worthless. You can get rid of it. <clears throat> and yesterday he learned that not only is the tefillin epis, but even the highest levels of passion don't come close to the, to the mitzvah itself. So it's not just Sometimes a person, as he says, doesn't have all the feelings that they would like to have. And it's still very significant because, as I gave you the metaphor, you're doing what your best friend wants, you're doing what your spouse wants, you're doing what Hashem wants. It's even deeper than that. Even if you're having the most amazing passion in the world, you talk about Madrega, you feel everything. That, that's not the Ike, that pales in comparison to the, to, the, to the mitzvah itself. So he said they put on tefillin the first time in a way that he never did before. Amos? Okay. So you have an halacha, you have a difference between a sachir and a shliach. A sachir or a poyal, you have an employee. Employee who let's say, sits in your office and works with you. The person is near you a whole day. <laughs> They're in your office. They speak to you, they hear you, they listen to you, they have conversations with you. Okay, today, maybe after corona, you have employees, uh, but, uh, you know, in the olden days, an employee worked near you, he worked with you. You have meetings, you connect, and so forth. You don't say usually in halacha, that the employee is the employer. Hopefully you don't say that, right? The inmate's running the time. Huh? The, inmate's the, inmates, <laughs> the inmate is running the... The, the, yeah. the, the, the employee is an employee. Hopefully before he does important things, he asks you. Then you have another musag in halacha. It's called a shliach. What's a shliach? Shliach is somebody you send away far from you to do a mission. It could be another country you sent him to. He doesn't see you, he doesn't hear you. What's the halacha by shliach? Shlucha shaladam, kemaisa. He represents the one who sent him, halachically. Somebody wants to marry a woman, betroth the woman. The shliach does it for him, it's as though he did it. Same is true with a get and many other halachas of shlichas. Shlucha shaladam kemaisa. And, and in halacha, Rabbi Yosef Engel in the explains that there's a level of shlichas in halacha it's not just what you're doing works as though the person who sent you did it. It's not even like an extended arm. It's that you become the Meshalech. It's almost like you embody, like a, 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 an embodiment of the Meshalech. Kenagen hamanagen, yeah, the Magid. Gedengst. Before Corona. Kenagen hamanagen. You become the Nigan. So the paradox is the employee is sitting with me a whole day, 10 hours a day. He's not me. The shliach is the other side of the world. It's kamoisa. What's the difference? So this is the difference. I could be near you and feel you and close to you. So I'm feeling close to you. I'm experiencing you, which is very profound and it's beautiful. And a relationship needs that. <laughs> a relationship needs that. But that's the yesh part of the relationship. The real oneness of the relationship is I may actually be sent far away from you. There, I'm not near you. I'm you. I'm you. See, but I don't feel. <laughs> you don't have to feel. <laughs> you're, you have to feel when you're not me. When you're me, you don't have to feel. And that's what he says. That Kishma, Karbanus, the fire, it's all the beginning of Avaidus Hashem. 
I say the beginning, it's not so beginning, it's, it's pretty deep to develop the fire, it's, it's profound. But he says, the Tamas actually to go to places that seem remote, to, to, to use this martial weiter. When a person is passionate and on fire towards truth, towards the Rebbeinu Shalolam, there's a closeness. In many ways, mitzvahs maiseus is going away. It's stepping away from, from the hislavos, from the, from the experience of dveikus. He says it's stepping away from the experience of dveikus, but the dveikus is actually much deeper. Oh, mazel tov. The day after the chasna, Mela the day of the chasna. He didn't go to sleep last night, huh? That's a very devoted student. You automatic A on the finals. <laughs> you graduate with honors, valedictorian. You can give the speech tomorrow. <laughs> so the terms, in, in, in terms of, of the oneness, it's, it's much deeper. He's, why? Because I'm fulfilling your will. And your will, he says, in Hashem's will in heaven and earth is identical. I want to also just convey one more point, even though this really needs a, a longer discussion, but I just want to bring it out, just the point of it. With this line in the Kutatayra, the Alter Rebbe was also synthesizing and making peace, real peace, not just fake peace, not fake news, synthesizing these two streams in Yiddishkeit that split up the Jewish world in his time. What was known then as the world of Chassidus, the world of the Chassidim, and the world of the Mesnagdim, the opponents to Chassidus. There was, there was a huge, huge, unfortunately, there was a huge, huge conflict, a lot of misunderstanding. After a few decades later, a few decades later, things quieted down. But during the, the Balatanya's days, you probably know the history, the conflict was very, very profound. Like in every Machlekes, there are rabble-rousers who just like the action and, you know, can spread, you know, can gossip and slander, etc. But I'm not talking about that Nakuda, which may, may have been a major factor as well. I'm talking now more the pnimius of the conflict. If somebody would ask, even today, what did the Baal Shem Tov want to accomplish? What did Chassidus want to accomplish? So one of the common answers, and to a certain degree, it's also a correct answer, even though it's not. <laughs> but to a certain degree, it's also correct. And I know I sound like I'm contradicting myself, and I know that. Is to bring, to bring much more feeling to Judaism. Feeling. Hergish. Rachmana Libeboy. God wants the heart. All the stories about the Baal Shem Tev and his students, it's always focused on the simplicity, right? The emotions, the heart, goodwill, the, av- the Aves Hashem, the Aves Yisrael, the kid who comes to Shul, Yom Kippur, right? and he copies a chicken, you know the mice, kukuriku, kukuriku, kukuriku. You know the story of Michal? The Baal Shem Tev was once davening, Yom Kippur, and there's Talmudim souls in the Illa time that he was very, very intense. He was very serious. So they realized that something is happening. So they davened with more kavana, more kavana, and the, nothing was, uh, Baal Shem Tov was like just crying and sobbing. There was a kid who grew up on a farm, a Jewish kid. He grew up on a farm. He was an orphan. A farmer took him in, and he was illiterate, which was very common at the time in Eastern Europe. It was extremely common. He was mamish illiterate. He partially didn't even know how to read, not like he didn't understand Hebrew. He couldn't read the Olive Bay as well. And he's there, Yom Kippur, in the ambiance of Shul. Once a year, they came to Shul, Yom Kippur. Usually they would you know, be, in the, be in the farm, far away from any community. But uh, this is Ukraine, a Ukrainian kid. And he comes into Shul, and he's there, and he sees the ambiance, and he's inspired. But he doesn't know how to daven. But one thing he knows, he hangs around chickens. So he knows how the chickens scream and get excited, right? And he was a professional because this was his whole life. So when Shuli starts screaming, Kukuriku, 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 K
with a whole heart. So you know what the Gaboyim do in these situations, right? They have a meltdown, and they come over to you, and they threaten you. Either you be quiet, or you chucked when you're embarrassing the whole shit. And this kid is screaming. He was a kid. Huh? <laughs> over here, the Gaboy, we say, wouldn't even uh, blink. <laughs> Compliments. It was a measure bush in Ukraine by the Balshamtov. So the Balshamtov turned around with a big smile on his face, and they saw that. And he said, "Leave him, leave him." But so Yom Kippur by the Sudha, he said that there was a he saw a tremendous gzeir, a tremendous decree on a certain community, and whatever he was doing wasn't accomplishing it. And this kukuriku of this child obliterated all of the negative decrees. It's a really, it's a heartwarming story, and that's the point. It's a heartwarming story. Now you'll tell it, for example, to what they call it. I don't like the name, but I'll just use it for cultural reasons. You tell it to Akalta Litvak. What is he going to say? Huh? <laughs> you get the point. All, all of, all of the, all of the. I don't mean here a one person or another person. I've learned that uh, labels don't really exist. I'm talking about the, the attitude. What do you want? There's halacha, there's how you daven. <laughs> Today, taka things are much different because the Baal Shem Tev achieved a lot of what he wanted to achieve, at least some of what he wanted to achieve. But the point is, the heart, the sincerity, yeah. There was another stream that focused much more on halacha. Kevayachal. So it became as though there's this division. Here the focus is emotions, sincerity, attitude, camaraderie, God loves you. And here the focus became much more, just follow the laws. <laughs> emotions are not so important. Know your stuff. And, and, and it, there's a respect for knowledge, for information, for scholarship, and so forth. And the two streams... Till today, even though it's very, very different today because there's cross-pollination, but till today, there's still this, uh, there's still, uh, yeah, the cross-pollination is critical. You can't, you, can't, you can't grow without that. You can't have a world without it. The Alter Rebbe, the, the Talmudim of the Maggot called him the Litvak. Now, does Lutzut the Torah, does he sound like a Litvak in Lutzut the Torah? Why did they call him the Litvak? So he came from the area of Lithuania, that's true, but that wasn't the reason. The reason was, the Alter Rebbe wanted to be Megala, what's the Pnimius of Teres HaBal Shemtev? The Pnimius of Teres HaBal Shemtev is not a different stream of Yiddishkeit versus the more Lithuanian derech that focuses on meticulous halacha, you daven in the earliest time, you do the mitzvahs, exactly it says in Shulchan Aruch, Rabbi Yosheh Ber who was a grandson, a son of Reb Chaim Briska, grandson of the Beis Halevi, came from the family, the skin of Reb Chaim Valozhner, who was a student of the Vilna, the prime student of the Vilna Gaon, has a sefer called the Halachic Man, Ish HaHalacha. You read it in English or in Hebrew? In English. It's a very sophisticated book, and in it he tells a story. He tries to to paint a portrait of the Halachic Man versus the mystical man. That's, that's the point. Now he was got the, in his shiurim, he would always quote the Balatanya, but he tries to paint the picture, very romantic picture of the halachic man. So he tells a story. He grew up in a city called Chaslavich, a Russian city. And uh, his father was the Rav. His father's name was Reb Moshe Soloveitchik. He was the Pchar, the oldest son of Reb Chaim Brisker, Reb Chaim Soloveitchik. The Briskerov, Reb Velvola, was his uncle, the Griz, his father's younger brother, Reb Yitzchak Zeev Halevi he, he, he was saved. He moved to Yerushalayim. Reb Moshe came to America, and he became the Rosh Yeshiva of Yeshiva's Rabbeinu Yitzchak al known as Yeshiva University. When his father passed away in 1942, so Rabbi J.B. Soloveitchik, Reb Yosheba, replaced him. It wasn't so simple. It was a big machlaikas who should replace him. So it was actually the sixth Lubavitcher Rebbe who got involved. The Rebbe Rayat wanted very much Rebbe Soloveitchik should take over. 
writes, my son-in-law knows him from Berlin, and he says he's an Isha Ashkoilis. He's a, a great figure. In any case, so Rabbi Yashabet tells a story. He says his father was Rabbi Moshe Salavich. He's a real, lit, real Litvish Yid, a, a, a son of the Salavichs. The Baltekeya, the one who blew Shefer Rosh Hashanah, he says was a Chabad Chassid. He writes there, who was fluent in Lakuta Torah. So he said the Chabad Chassid takes the Shefer, starts saying the Pesukim in Ametzar Karosi, and he bursts out sobbing. And he can't control himself. They finish the Pesukim, he starts saying the Brachas, he's sobbing. So Yosheb Ben says, he was a kid. Why is he sobbing? He says, I can only speculate because he knew what it says in Lakuta Torah about blowing shofar. <laughs> and he describes that the narrow part of the shofar represents the tzimtzum. <laughs> and the broad part of the shofar, in Hametzar, the broad part of the shofar represents dveikus, complete oneness. And that the whole world is based on a tzimtzum. The whole world is based on restrictive energy. And the soul yearns to be free, to be emancipated from its spiritual slavery and become subsumed in ain't soif. And he says, and it's very emotional. So you start crying. He says, my father was a mistaget. So he looks at him. Was meinst du? Was meinst du? When the shackles lull of ain't When you shake lull of, you also cry. And he used the words of the Gemara. Rachmana Amar Tiku. The Torah says, blows, blows, vanished. We does not say in a mitzvah that he's supposed to cry with Kishof? <laughs> by Lulav, you also cry? So Rabbi Salavetra cries. Of course he didn't cry by Lulav. Because by Lulav, it says in Lukut the Torah, it's the celebration of nature, and it's the affirmation that Enoid Malvadoi, that God exists in every leaf, and in every willow, and in every citrus, and in every palm branch, <laughs> and in every myrtle branch, that's Sukkot. But Kiya Shoifer, Faket, it's going out of the symptom. It's, it's a time to cry. What was his father referring to? The Gemara says in Rosh Hashanah Dav Tazayin, Amir Rebavo, Lama Toikin, B'Shoifer, Shalai. Why do we blow on a Shoifer Rosh Hashanah? So the Gemara gets upset. Lama Toikin, Rachmama Amatiku. Why we blow? Because the Torah says to blow. That's why we blow. Tiku Bachay the Shoifer. Someone says, no, he was asking why a ram's horn. So he says, because of the Akedah of Yitzchak. So his father paraphrased that Gemara and says, Rachman Amar Tiku, Rachman Amar Tifku. If the Torah would have said cry, we would stand and cry. <laughs> Rabbi Salvechik is trying to bring out the two worlds with tremendous respect for both. It's not this is his father, and this is something he, was, he felt very close to. In this Maimer, you could see what the Al-Tarebbe, what the Al-Tarebbe is teaching here. The Tereb is teaching that all the conflict is coming from a more superficial place. Even though it was be sometimes between great people. I say superficial, I don't mean superficial like uh, in a derogatory way. I mean, if you go to the oimek of the oimek, it's fakert. <laughs> fakert. The oimek ter sachsidus is not saying without passion, eh, there's nothing. The mitzvah itself in a way, the Al-Tareb is bringing out here the shit <laughs> that a post chsidus al pi You understand what I'm saying? What, what, what if you, why doesn't he start the Maimah with this? Why doesn't he start the Maimah with the first, with, why does he start the Maimah with this? Or to ask another question, why do you need a fire? Don't have a fire. See, this is what you want, this is what you want. I don't, I don't feel. The answer is, because then the relationship is missing something very deep. Even though it's true, but if a person doesn't experience anything, it doesn't permeate me as a person. So I remain estranged. That's why you need the fire. But then he says there's something even deeper than the fire. The fire can lead you to a certain place. Like Taka in a marriage or good friends. It doesn't begin, let's have a relationship. Just tell me what you want and I'll do it. You want me to live at the other side of the world? I'll live at the other end of the world. <laughs> That's not how it works. You first build up a closeness where, yes, I'm on, I'm on fire. I love you. I crave you. I want to be close to you. Then you realize that there's something even deeper. 
What's deeper? Oneness itself. Which the passion won't capture. Because the passion will always capture, as he says, what was his Russian? <laughs> Just the, those few words are, uh, are priceless. When there's a Slavos, I'll call upon him, Mukhrich Lias, Shayit Sayer, Eze Yesh, Vedavim, Befneyatsma. Passion, the prerequisite of passion is Yesh. As I said yesterday, not a bad Yesh at all, a very, very holy Yesh. But that's the prerequisite. I'm on fire. There's a heart, there's a soul that's burning. In Ein Oid and Bittel B'Metzius Legamri, he doesn't find a space for himself. Why not? Because my will is your will. And Hashem's will is identical in the lowest places like in the highest places. And my will is your will. There's no separateness. And that's the power of the mitzvah. And that's why I call Akari Krishma Belay Tfilin. That's the power of the Tfilin. Tfilin again represents Huksha Kalatari Kulala Tfilin. Hashem wanted to do the betachtoinim, so I could step away from my spirituality and go into the place of tachtoinim, as he says, whether it's learning zroyim, moyed, noshim, nazik, and kachim taris, or it's mitzvahs, maisias, practical mitzvahs, physical actions, maisa, the tefillin, the lulav, the candle, the challah, the mezuzah. The tzitzis, all physical. The money, the tzedakah, the truma, the maestras, the payah. Most of the 630 mitzvahs deal with very, very physical, physical stuff. Or, as he says, even I go into business, I completely step away from the world of Ruchnius. He says, Here you're not passionate about your master. Here you are your master. You are. So he gave, he gave the real amkus of what halacha is. <laughs> it's not like there's the passion in Judaism and then there's those who believe in technicalities. Don't, don't. Chassidus <laughs> revealed the oimik of what halacha is, what a mitzvah is, what the technicality of the mitzvah is. If you don't understand it this way, taka the technicalities can turn you into a technocrat. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? It can, it can take, take away passion. Here is where you see the synthesis of the two streams in Yiddishkeit. By revealing the etzim of Elikus, there's no contradiction. Fakert, it's all one. It's all one. I just wanted to say that. Is it a little clear what I'm saying? You know, it's easy. You look at these two lines. You have to understand what this meant. Because... Even Chassidus was fire, fire. Chassidim davened with a fire. And then, you know, it's, it's, I'm talking here real Chassidus. I'm not talking here the culture. I'm not talking here Kugel. That's not Chassidus. You understand? I'm talking here the, the fire of Chassidus. They brought nigunim, dancing, fabrengen, alechayim, camaraderie, right? That whole, that whole culture. You don't just daven through a davening. It's with passion. And here he's, he's, he's mavatalit in Gansen. He's not mavatalit. He's saying there's a void and there's a void at time. Okay. Hashem Yichud. Hashem Yichud, yeah. 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 The Noi Debihuda was very against it. He didn't like it. He has a tshuva. Right? You know his tshuva. Noi Debihuda was from the big Paiskim of the dirt. Now, it, it's really much more nuanced because <laughs> Reb Chaim Valajan says that the Vilna Gon, most of his time he learned Kabbalah, not Nigla. You know, he's considered the father of all the literature yeshivas, but the Vilna Gon himself learned Kabbalah most of the time. Now, try to introduce that as a curriculum into a mainstream yeshiva. Reb Chaim Valajan also was a big, big Makobal. So it's, it's much more nuanced. It's not like there was a group that grew only, only Gemara and the group that believed in Kabbalah. The Vilna Gon learned Tremendous, more Kabbalah than, uh, he spent more time learning Kabbalah. But nonetheless, these differences do have some, you know, some general accuracy, even if it's much more nuanced than I'm, what I'm saying. And that's why somebody who learned very well Shulchan Aruch Harav once told me he doesn't know how to make Shalom bias between Lakut Teira and the uh, Alter Rebbe Shulchan Aruch. If you ever learned Alter Rebbe Shulchan Aruch, it's like... Uh, 
I don't want to call it a litvish a mahalach, because, but it's it's classic, classic lumdus. <laughs> you know, the quintessential, quintessential lumdus, especially kuntus achera, and the, the the details and the accuracy of the details, and the technicalities. His bamedvarim amurims, and everything is accounted for. And then bamedvarim amurim, middle of a bamedvarim amurim, another bamedvarim amurim. And the definition of every halacha, and then in the Kutta Torah, I mean, you see this ecstasy constantly. But now here you see that it was, it's not just two people. <laughs> Somebody once wrote something very foolish about the Rambam. He wrote that the Rambam in Mishnah Torah and the Rambam in the Guide to the Perplexed are two different Rambams, a split personality. Because the Marian of and the Rambam is a very, very free and liberal thinker, so to speak, real rationalist. And Yad HaChazaka, it's halach and all of its precision. I once saw a professor in Israel, a shaita. So he writes that Yad HaChazaka, the Rambam wrote because he was nostalgic to how he grew up. <laughs> and Mary Nebuchadnezzar expressed what he really thought. So it's, it's, a, it's a stupid joke because <laughs> you read Yad HaChazaka, you see the Rambam. <laughs> He's there in his full presence. It's just people capture people according to themselves, you understand? Whenever you make a judgment on somebody else, you're really just making a judgment on yourself. Who knows somebody else? When you start doing that to the Rambam, it becomes pretty pathetic. The truth is, so when you, by the Balatanya, it's one person, Mamish, the Tanya, the Torah, the Lakut, the Torah, the Maimonim, and the Shulchan Aruch HaRav. When Al-Tarebbe would say Maimonim, I don't know if you know, I told this to you a few years ago, he would start, you remember, I, wish, I said this, that Al-Tarebbe would very often, in the middle of a Maimer, he was sitting or standing and he would start rolling on the ground. And not consciously. He just went into a state of, of, of transcendence and he would start rolling. And he would bump into the walls. And the walls were made of concrete, of cement, so he started to bleed. So they cushioned all the walls. He had one of his chayzrim was Rapinchas Reizes. So when the Altarebbe would roll, it was hard to hear the words. So he would roll after him so that he wouldn't miss anything. Sometimes the Al-Tarebbe would make a turn, he would miss a word. The Maimadim that he wrote were almost verbatim. So if the Al-Tarebbe turned, or the Al-Tarebbe lowered his, his head while he was rolling, he missed a few words. So the Pinchas Reizes won't fill in those few words with his imagination. He'll leave blank a few words. And you know that here, something happened. Something happened. That's how precise he was. He wouldn't fill, it, he wouldn't fill in the blanks. And then you look at the Shulchan Aruch Harav, it's so different. But here in this Maimer, we see not just that there's Shalom bias, that the two can live together. It's really one Nakuda. And each one gives something priceless to the other one. It's clear. Everybody understands what I'm talking about. This is a continuation to yesterday's Shir, obviously. So to summarize it, when you say there's something much deeper than passion, right? In many ways, that's the most passionate thing you could say. <laughs> it's anything but technical. Because what it's really saying is, you don't feel me, you become me. And never ever reduce the power of the relationship to feelings. <laughs> because even if there are tremendous feelings... They don't capture the full, incredible opportunity of real fusion. Of real fu fusion means real achtos. L'chad, Rabbi Isaac should have told me that after yesterday's shir, when he put on tefillin, it was the most boring experience of tefillin ever. Because passion? Passion belongs in the dustbin. He said it was the most exciting experience of tefillin. What's the excitement? <laughs> That itself is the deepest excitement. <laughs> the oneness is tremendously exciting, right? But don't let the excitement define the depth of the experience. Don't limit it to that. This is not cold. <laughs> this is very hot. This is very passionate. This is not cold technical technicalities. The Bezriel Fashtest, the Moishezev, you're with us? Hashem wasn't afraid of the finite world. Don't be afraid of the finite world. Also, 
Somebody who doesn't have a chush and mysticism, it's hard to relate to all of this. I don't have a problem being in the finite world. I like the finite world. You have to, as I said yesterday, you have to see how the Alter Rebbe saw a person. He saw a neshama as really infinite. So you don't belong in, in, in a finite world. <laughs> it's like a sandbox. Sepasnisht. Well, what do you have? What do you have with trauma? What do you have with abuse? What do you have bechlal with hagbola? What do you have with all these things? You're infinite. That itself is very powerful, just to ask that question. And what's the answer? The answer is, you're, God, you're, you're, you're a piece of God. God came into to, to, to a world of trauma, you also. And in that, you're more one than anything else. Because you become an embodiment of the Rebbe Yisraelim, and he wanted a Rebbe Tachtonim, so you go there. And for him, the whole learning, what was it really? It was finding the infinite and the finite. When he opened up a Gemara, what did he see? The infinite and the finite. Opened up a Mishnah, the infinite and the finite. A Mitzvah, the infinite and the finite. A person going to their business, the infinite and the finite. It also explains something else. What happened to meditation in Judaism? Now this is a problem, but I just want to explain culturally what happened. You go over to many Jews, very observant Jews, and you say, do you ever meditate? And they'll look at you. You know, what are you taking? Whose classes have you been going to? What happened to you? You have a midlife crisis? Go over to a regular Rav in Muncie and Barrett Park. You could try it out. <laughs> you don't have to quote me. <laughs> You've been going to Rabbi Waiwa? Huh? You're having issues, yeah? Your marriage is not... The vibe of the Arez from von Stubb. You must be lonely. Right? And somebody once told me, he said, your classes are good, but they're good for sick people. They're not for healthy people. Are you, talk, are you told me. <laughs> he says, your classes are very good. It's like you tell a doctor, you know, you're an unbelievable doctor, but you're for sick people. I don't, I'm not sick. <laughs> what do you say about such a compliment? Huh? I, should, I don't know if I should have said it to this crowd here, but uh, I'm just being honest with you. That's what he told me. Huh? Very good. Chaylas Avani. Ah, nice. Nafshi Chaylas Avasecha. The Arizal says that Chayla is Begematria Memtes. You know that? Chayla, Ches Vav Lamed is 49. He says, because why are you sick? Because you have the 40, 49 gates of wisdom and you're, 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 you're sick. You're yearning for the Shar Hanun, so you're a Chayla. <laughs> Very good. Chaylas Avani. Matagidula, yeah? Matagidula, Shechelis Avon. Okay, thank you, Nichamtani. You comforted me. <laughs> you comforted me. But w- what was his point? What was, I, I'm not going to explain. I said, Al Tereb explained the, 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 the other side. I can also explain what he meant. What did he mean? He meant mainstream Judaism. What are you hakimi maisis? What are you hakimi? <laughs> Just do the right thing and be happy. So that's why the whole world of meditation, of, of, of ruchni, is of, do you have an intimate experience with God? I don't know what that looks like. I'll eat matzah, I'll eat matzah. But I want to explain to you the beauty of it and the problem of it. The beauty of it is because in the heart of hearts, Jew, the Jewish soul feels what this mimer says. That all the meditation in the world won't come close to the, to the matzah. To the lulav and Esther, to the tefillin. The challenge is that sometimes, that's why the Baal Shem Tov came to the world, that can become stripped from its depth. But, 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 but you understand where it's coming from? I'm explaining to you how that developed. It developed because I could sit and meditate on the exodus of Egypt and not do matzah. And you know what? I'll have an amazing experience. What does redemption look like in my life? And you should do it by the Seder, by the way. Not a bad idea. I'm going to have to eat matzah. I have to eat a piece of stale matzah, which is not carbs and doesn't even taste good. Tefillin. Sit and meditate. There's people who do. I know a person, I have a friend, he, he meditates every day in the morning, two hours. Two hours he meditates. Atkan. So now I have to take a black box that was made from the part, from the hide, the epidermis of a cow. Right? So take my Jewish blood pressure. Okay, that went over you. Huh? And, and, and start tying, I mean, that, that really contributes to meditation? I mean, it's... Uh, 
we don't we take it for granted because you're here in shul, right? We try something to go 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 to an airport in Kentucky and do it. You know, I have a friend. He was flying to Atlanta. He put on tefillin. It was after 9/11. They made an emergency landing. They saw him putting on boxes. You know what they thought the next step is? Allah Akbar. Khum. No, no, you got very scared. If you go on a plane, like you have to tell the flight attendant what you're doing and the people near you, because people can get very scared. So I'm explaining to you. Uh, again, you have either two streams. There's a big spiritual consciousness today, and yet many Jews who are so immersed in Taita, they laugh from it. They're cynical. They want to know if you're sick, go do it. If you're not sick, don't do it. We, we, we who's right? Again, here you have here you have the nakuda of everything. Without the spirituality, without the spiritual experience, often the, the most powerful unity is stripped from the significance of it in a way that you can really viscerally appreciate it. And yet, and yet, Yiddishkeit takes it a step deeper and says, it's not only about me wanting to be connected to you, but it's the ability and the opportunity to experience true, true, full dveikas, full, full unity. And that's deeper than the fire. It's deeper than the experience of it. What is it? It's actually when the I and the thou, the I and the you, experience fusion. And it's even beyond the experience. And, and the passion of that moment is beautiful and tremendous, and it certainly feels good. But that pales in comparison to the, to the dvekas itself. Make sense what I'm saying? Okay, so let's learn another few minutes. We'll learn another nine minutes. <clears throat> I just want to learn here another piece because I want to finish the Maimed this week. So we're up to Mem Aleph, column one, page 81. These last few lines that we learned, you could read these lines literally 101 times and not get enough of it. I would do it, but then you're going to start saying that I'm also sick. <laughs> I'm just joking, but Chaylas uh, Ava. But these these few lines, I don't know how many times you could say it. You know, you know what I mean. It's almost like just to hear the person who says these words, just these words. Okay, I'm going to say it. I have to say it again. Mashaki bebchines ein oy du bittel bemetzias legamri lo yamtzi mokum la atzmoi klal ve ein lo yrotzen ache kim ritzayin Hashem yisbaruch ve yrotzen Hashem who shove le mata kamay le mayla. Over there, there's no high and low. Oh, yeah, I'm in such a low place. I want to be near you. Now you are me. You, you could go to a low place. You are me. It's also a tremendous comfort for people who are going go through lows in life. There are people, let's take a talk about, you know, <laughs> who's not sick, right? That's another point, right? If you're not sick, you're not alive. <laughs> it's like... If you don't have any pain, you know which world you're living in. <clears throat> God is in pain. The Shechina is in pain. You're the only one not in pain. But that ability to be able to know that all my journeys, right? It's not, I'm excited. I'm not excited. It's not, it's not Geshmak. Not Geshmak. But Here, you're not connected to the source. You are the source. It's the infinite consciousness having a finite experience. It's almost like Hashem is taking this journey through you because at this point there's no you and I. And in the heavenly passion, you don't have that. In the heavenly passion, I'm excited about you. And here, I'm not excited about you. I'm actually in a place that's not exciting. That's what Diri B'tachdayna means. But I'm you. So that gives another level of excitement, another level of meaning. So he says, That's why it says in the Chadoidi, the end of Maisa, that's the first Machshava. What does that mean? The Saif Maisa, which seems like the most remote, that's the Machshava Tchila. That's where you connect to the first thought. Saif Maisa, the end of Maisa. In other words, the end, end, end of Maisa, which is the most remote. That's the Machshav Adchila. This state, this 
this awareness, this is called Eretz Knan. Why Eretz Knan? Miloshin Hachnov Hashpala. The word Knan, Knan was a name of one of Noyach's grandsons. Noyach had three sons, and Ham had a son Knan, and he lived in Eretz Knan. But he says the word Knan comes from the word Nichna, Knia. What is that? Humility. Rashi says, Hachna. Hachna means, uh, what's the word? Uh, in Yiddish, untertenikait. <laughs> in English, humility, I don't know. Subservient. Yeah, I wouldn't use that word here. I wouldn't use that word here. I guess, because subservience is a different akuda. But the point is, it is a, humble, a humbling element. Shenoifalu mashpilas atzmei lamata. Because what's Eretz Kanan telling you? I have to humble myself to go away from heaven, to go, to go down, to go down. I'm going away from, from the experience of Dvekas. I'm going into the physical. On this it says, Shleim HaMelech says, its legs go down into death. There is also a danger here. When you're right near your best friend, when you're right near your spouse, you're close. When you go far away, maybe you become me, but you're in a different place and you could get captured by the physical, including by physical addictions. So it says, You have to work on yourself. That's why there's a temptation to stay close because with this fire, it's also much healthier, it seems. There's an element of ragla yardis mavis. Now here, there's a small parenthesis for a few lines. Uksiv the Pasuk says, Ki v'yachel eretz ha-knani, Moshe Rabbeinu says in Dvarim, He'll bring you to the land of Knani, G'doylim v'atsumim, very powerful nations. Uksiv v'gamis ha-tziri, Yishalach Hashem alakecha b'am, Ad ha-voyda nishanu v'nistanu v'panecha. Hashem is going to send some type of hornet called a tzira, until it will obliterate those who remain and those who are hiding, the enemies who don't want the Jews to go into Eretz Yisrael. V'inye not tzira, what's this hornet? Amru Razal Chazal say in Saita, Sha tzira hoysa misami esenea melmailo misarsa melmata. The Gemara says, Rish Lakish says that the tzira, this hornet, didn't cross the Jordan. It stayed on one side of the Jordan, you remember this? And it would... Uh, blind the eyes of the enemy on top and it would uh, make them sterile on the bottom. What does that mean? So he explains it means something spiritual. When you're going into Eretz Kanan, you have to have a tzir, you have to have a hornet. What is this? So he says as follows. <clears throat> the Gemara says in Chagiga, where does Gehenim come from? Fire, it comes from the sweat of the malachim. <laughs> Zayasan, the sweat of the Chayas HaKadosh, their sweat, creates a river of fire. Nahar Dinur, Dinur is Dinura, fire in Aramaic. The sweat of the malachim creates a river, sweat is wet, creates a river of fire on the head of the Rishayim in Gehenim. What does this mean? What does this mean? Gehenim is made up out of sweat? It's fire, it's water. What does it mean a river of fire? I thought fire, it's not a river. A river is not fire. It says, Pidush, it's very interesting. Zeya hu eres v'chayma. Sweat represents here a certain form of poison and anger. Kamashikosov in Yirmi Yechov Gimel. Hine saras Hashem chayma yotza. There's a storm of God, a, a wrath went out. Vuhu psoilus shalahem. This is the dregs, the psoilus. Psoilus is like the sediments. The, the leftover sediments, the unwanted parts. In every world, in every state of consciousness, there's toiv and ra, good and bad. I don't mean in every world is real evil, what we call evil. No. Ra doesn't necessarily mean heinous evil in every world. No. Ra means an element of anger. Of, unforgive, of unforgiveness, of wrath. In every world is chesed and gvura. Gvura is not bad, 
But Gvura could be a source of judgmentalism, of, of negativity. I'm angry. I'm angry. He says, that's what I mean, this Tevur now in every world. Tevur is generosity, love, closeness, and Gvura is rejection. Every person is a miniature world. You always have both. You have the toiv and you have the ra. What's the point of gvura? You need to trigger it sometimes internally. A person needs to be able to be harsh towards their own toxicity, not to allow it to rule your life, to be able to put it in its place, to be able, you have to have compassion that it exists, but don't let it take over your life. You have to put it, you have to put it in context. You're not going to rule. You may have a backseat driver who wants to take over the steering wheel and crash straight into a, to a pump or go down a cliff. You have to tell the backseat driver, I get it, <laughs> but... <laughs> A, you, you need a gvura, you need a strength, you need a severity to put your own toxicity in its place, not let it rule your life. That's a very important idea, extremely important. So he says, says in You should always get the Yetzir angry at the Yetzir. What does this mean? Always, this is what I do 24 hours a day. I have to get my Yetzir. He says, He says, if not, the anger is going to come out towards your wife, it's going to come out towards your kids, it's going to come out towards everything else besides what it has to come out to. A person always has roigas. There is anger waiting in you. Well, it's not usual for the Alter Rebbe to say this. There's a roigas waiting. It's waiting to implode. It's waiting to explode. It's there. A person has both. One of the malachim that, that Avram fought with. He says, So use it, but use it for the right things. Use it to be able to put it in its place and say, well, I don't, I'm not so small. I don't have to surrender to this negativity, to this toxicity. And if I do, I put it in its place. That's what it means. Doesn't mean you deny. It doesn't mean you repress it. Doesn't mean you get angry at yourself and delegitimize yourself. But deny in me, I have to be able in a good way. I have to be able to be strong with it, to be stern with it. And when you do it to that part of you, then you don't have to do it to anybody else. You don't even have to do it to your good parts. The problem is we often misplace it. I take my anger and I use it towards my positivity. I'm bad. I'm evil. I'm a sick person. I'm a loser. He says, well, no, no, that's not good. Direct it towards the Ra, that's it, <laughs> internally. The parts of me that tell me how bad I am, the parts of me that tell me how, what a loser I am, the parts of me that want to constantly take me off the highway and throw me into a cliff, put it in its place. Say, I get you, you have it, <laughs> but you're not going to control my life. This <laughs> This is what's called Gehenna. This fire of Gehenna, <laughs> where does it come from? It comes from the sweat of the Malachim, from the passion of the Malachim, which is the first parish of Krishna. When a person experiences the fire of the Malachim, so from the sweat of that fire comes a fire of Gehenna. What's that? <laughs> from that passion comes also a Gvura, a sense of anger. But what, what type of anger? A sense of anger where the person says, I know who I am. I'm infinity. You want to be one when he experiences Hashem Echot. So the person says, why do I feel that I have to live in a way that's not really me? And 
after the fire of the first parsha, Shema Yisrael, we explained before, it's a carbon, comes the second part. In the second part, we speak about Hashem getting angry. So how does everybody read this? Hashem gets angry at you. He says it's much deeper. You remember what it says, right? I'll give you rain. Yeah? If you go to other gods, God is going to get angry. So al says like this. All day, you're not, you're not a poetic oil. <laughs> Even if you're not involved in Avodah Hashem, you're a fine person. But Bashas, the person gets into davening and Krishna, and they experience a much deeper level of unity, and they get on fire. So now you see yourself in a new way. And now even the smallest distance, you see in a different way. So he says, now you could say, <laughs> From what? From the true achtas, from the true oneness. And then the person gets upset. Why? I want to live in this place. That's what happens. <laughs> it's the God inside of you. Getting angry that you feel you're so low that you don't have to that you that you, that you feel you're so low that you can't live in unity and oneness. He says um, that that anger takes away the anger towards other parts of yourself and towards other people. If not, it comes out in in in, in all types of dysfunctional ways. This is another type of eshechlesh, yeah. So you you you, you what he's saying here. Only in the second part of Krishna do we speak about this anger. Because before that, there's no penyiftel of avchem, besartem, vavadatem. You didn't go to avedizara. You're a good person. Once a person experiences a different level of oneness. So now, I'll give you an example, okay? Let's take it a marriage again. Sometimes you have people that are married. It's more technical. Yeah, you know, it's like business partners. Once you experience a real level of unity, now you get upset. What do you get upset? You get upset at all the times, at all the times that you didn't, huh? You get upset at all the times that you didn't realize how good it could be. Now you get upset. Before that, I didn't have to get upset. You know what I mean? If we're just distant, fine. I like you, you like me. Once he gets so close, yeah, like the Baron Karlin at Rosh Hashanah, when they said Hamelech, he fainted. Said, Why did he faint? You know the Maisa. Because there's a story in Gittin that Vespasian told Rabbi Yechina ben Zaka, Rabbi Yechina ben Zaka came out of Yerushalayim during the time of the Chorban, and he went to meet Vespasian, Aspasianus, and he called him the king. So he said, Imalkana, if I'm the king, why didn't you come till now? So Baron Karlin said, when he said Hamelech, if God says, if I'm the king, where were you a whole year? <laughs> So Rabbi Kalina fainted. You understand? We were you a whole year. If we remain distant, okay. Once you become close, now you get upset. This is a good upsetness. Because there's another standard, there's another reality. Sometimes in healing, much more anger comes out. That's what he's saying. You hear? When you're estranged, you can't afford anger. <laughs> you just, <laughs> you survive. You do what you have to do. Once you feel the closeness, now you get angry. Because you see all the pain, you see all the hurt, you see all the distance. You get upset. You get upset. You have sometimes people who went through terrible abuse and they don't feel that they exist. When they start feeling the right to exist, the first thing, they'll be unbelievably angry. Now you could say, don't get angry. No, 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 no. <laughs> get angry. Vein zechais, vein zechais. Get angry. 
For this, this person, the anger is basically, wow, I exist. I'm entitled to have a life. I'm entitled to have a relationship. Wow, wow, wow. So why'd you do this to me? Why did you do this to me? That's a good sign. It's not a bad sign. It's a very good sign. That's what Al-Tareb is saying here. He says, that's what the Gehenna is. It comes from the Zayosam Shalchayas. It comes from the, from the passion of the Malachim. When you have the passion, and the passion gives you a real experience, so now I'm like, wow, where was I? Who stole this from me? People read that person in Krishna, they, again, we experience it wrong. Hashem gets angry at you. You're, you're, you are Hashem. You're getting angry at yourself. <laughs> you're one with God. When you experience that oneness, where was I? What happened here? Who took this away from me? Why did I think I'm so estranged yesterday? It's not an anger of judgment just to make you feel bad. It's an anger that comes from dignity. The Heis V'sachzak? This is very important stuff. Very important. Because part of the abuse is that you're not allowed to get angry. You don't exist. You're going to get angry? What are you going to get angry for? There's no anger. You're an Edelkite, right? And then you get a ticket, a certificate, Midas Tavis. He never got angry in eight years. Of course, you killed him. In the cemetery, nobody gets angry. You killed the kid. How can he get angry? He never did Avaidazara. Of course not. Dead people don't do Avaidazara. This class is brought to you by the yeshiva.net. Please help us continue the classes. Make even a small contribution at www.theyeshiva.net slash donate.